Egypt is a land of many mysteries that date back to ancient times, and to this day, discoveries are being made which challenge established theories and notions regarding how long civilization existed in those lands. Welcome to this episode of Top 5, The Weird and Mysterious. If you're new to this channel, welcome. There's a lot of live shows that take place right here every single week. So make sure to subscribe and hit the bell set for all notifications. Hello to everyone in the live chat watching this live. Nick, Jessica, Michael, Daniel, another Daniel, Ray, Joseph, Tyler. Welcome, everyone. This is going to be a really great topic. And we have no time to lose. Let's just get right into it. Let me bring in my guest today, documentary filmmaker, author, and investigative researcher, Mike Ricksecker. Mike, how are Christina, you? Christina, uh, doing pretty well. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Last time it went so well, I had you on Shifting the Paradigm last year, and you got to speak about your research about shadow people, the Alaskan Triangle, along with your own personal stories as well. So for those that haven't seen that interview, highly recommend but for those that are not familiar with your work can you give us just a super brief overview before we get into today's topic sure okay um where do i start so right you mentioned the uh the the shadow people and uh the alaska triangle so i'm primarily a writer and those are my last couple of books uh alaska's mysterious triangle and a walk in the shadows complete guide to shadow people but i have written a total of 12 books uh i'm also a filmmaker documentarian uh, my docu-series the shadow dimension is running right now on uh 2b tv and the roku channel and you know i have I, i've been doing a lot of research um traveling the world digging into a lot of these different esoteric topics and just recently you went to egypt so it only makes it appropriate today's topic is mysterious egypt because you had to do a lot of research for that trip. You did have and you produced a tour while you were there and you came across some pretty fascinating information. And let's go ahead and start off with Stargates. So when we think of the term Stargate, so many of us think of the iconic TV show and movie, right? But right. what is it actually? Can it actually be compared to the television show from your research? You know, it, it's interesting because um, when we look at some of the visages of different Stargates around the world, and a lot of times they look like a doorway. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We do have that visage of the, you know, very round looking type of portal uh, that we walk through. And yeah, just like that. There we go. <laughs> and uh, China has actually created a, um, you know, they, they call it China Stargate. It's not a real Stargate or anything like that, but basically it's a monument in a city that looks exactly like that but uh, when we look at uh, stargates from the ancient world like i said they look a little bit more like doorways and uh, maybe almost like the um you know kind of like that t-shape uh sort of thing almost like we see it go back to Tepe, but we'll see them inset into different uh you know walls side of mountains that sort of thing egypt is really almost like your classic doorway into a room and what they did was on the side of those doorways, they had the hieroglyphs that literally spelled out Stargate. And the research that uh, Mohammed Ibrahim has been doing, I've kind of, um, you know, been working with him here the last few years and, uh, you know, really diving headlong into that. Uh, we are finding that type of information and, and that label in a lot of different places in a variety of different ways as well. And so we actually made some interesting discoveries uh, this past month. So when you said that it's being discovered in multiple places in the sense of, of mm -hmm. hieroglyphs, right? Does it is it literally saying Stargate or is there that level is there that level of interpretation that you think it's saying that? No, it's it's literally saying that you have a a star and a gate symbol. Um, they and there's a couple of different ways that they're constructed. Sometimes it's star on top of a gate. Sometimes they're side by side. When we were at Dindara, um, there were some really interesting ones where it was a very large elongated gate, and then they had a series of stars. Uh, right above that. And the discovery that we made there was that uh, Muhammad had found um, a couple of these at one of his previous visits. But then as we looked closer around the room and actually outside 
of, of that particular room. We actually saw them wrapping around the walls in a number of different locations. One of the places where you've seen the hieroglyphs of them talking about a Stargate, and this is on your YouTube mm -hmm. channel, all of his links are below, by the way. You look at the Temple of Hathor and Dendera. So when you came across that temple and you saw that it said Stargate, what came to mind? Were you the first one that saw it or was it Muhammad, who is a native Egyptian? Mm -hmm. there? How did that work? Yeah, the way it worked, uh, Muhammad had us in the room. He was showing us and the whole the whole group. Um, on on top of the ceiling, uh, there's a depiction of you know the night sky of Earth, uh, this sort of thing. So he's kind of laying out the whole scene for us. And on one of the walls, he had previously found uh, the the symbols there designating Stargate. But then, as we're taking a closer look at that wall and the walls next to it, and even you know wrapping around the windows, it's like, wait a minute here. There are actually more designations of Stargates, and something that I'm interested in looking at because each gate had a different number of stars above it. So now I think the uh, key here is trying to decipher what exactly the different number of stars mean above that. So that's some additional work that we have to do here uh, down the road. But, uh, you know, one of the gates had uh, the Jed pillar. Uh, Can you explain what that is for those yeah, that don't know? Absolutely. So uh, the Jed pillar really is seen in many cases like the uh, the backbone of Egypt. And they had a ceremony every summer for the raising of the Jed Pillar. So this was like the raising of the consciousness of Egypt, bringing new energies uh, into the uh, into their civilization. So this was really their New Year's celebration uh, was centered around this. So when we see the Jed Pillar, uh, we get an idea that uh, this is you know, new energy being you know, brought into the uh, into the land. And we see a lot of times, yeah, there's the Jed Pillar right there. Uh, we see a lot of times this coinciding with snakes, snakes being another uh, symbol of, of energy. Uh, and when we, you, at Dindara there, uh, one of the things everybody points out are, you know, what they call the light bulb down in the one crypt. And actually there's three of them. And it's, uh, it constitutes, you have the, uh, the snake symbolizing the energy yeah, you have the lotus flower there symbolizing new life, and then you have the jed pillar, the raising of the consciousness of Egypt. So really, it's a depiction of of creation that's down there. And for that, for the jed pillar, I have to ask this once again, is mm -hmm. something that is interpreted or is it like that's exactly what it is? Because when I look at it, Mike, it looks like that thing that you use to get honey out. Oh, that's there's the that. first <laughs> thing that comes to mind. And so I'm like, okay, I wouldn't necessarily think of energy or anything related to it, but when you explain it the way that you do, you're like, okay, but that makes a little <laughs> bit more sense. But is there interpretation there when it comes well, to this? Yeah, when we see the depiction at Abydos, so when, when you're just looking at that hieroglyph right there, it looks small, and you know we've seen some other um, like little, almost like little trinkets that are made in that shape, but when you look at the depictions in Abydos on one of the walls in the very back of the Temple of Seti there, you see that these things were larger than a human. They were very tall. They took several people to be able to raise these. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people have likened the shape to the Tesla coil. And I find that very interesting because uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, was very interested in harnessing the Earth's energy for uh, for electricity, for wireless communication around the world. And you had the ancient Egyptians there, and he was he was very knowledgeable of uh, a lot of ancient technology. And you have ancient Egypt there, where they were using this as a way to raise those energies and raise that consciousness. So there's definitely a relationship there. Very interesting. Tyler has a question, mm -hmm. and I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm just going to read the middle part. But he's asking, have you ever seen any evidence of stargates at Egypt? Because Robbie Williams claimed that he could see a portal to a nether sky above the pyramids. Yeah, so a um, couple of things. One, we could talk about Egypt's uh, Area 51, where there, and I have not been inside Egypt's Area 51, but it's right there next to uh, the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. It's actually uh, uh, 
uh, it's a military installation, which actually has the remnants of what they call the unfinished pyramid there. And there are rumors and stories coming out of there that they actually do have a working Stargate. And it looks like a uh, Aurora Borealis that's on the ground. It's like a, it's a circle with all these swirling colors. Now, I haven't seen that personally, but I have seen evidence of that uh, within the ancient architecture and within the ancient symbolism. And to me, the really fantastic depiction of this is at Hatshepsut's temple. Um, and the way that's constructed, if you'll let me, uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I can go ahead and Please. describe that. So when you walk up to Hatshepsut's temple, basically it's this long, tall staircase that goes up into the temple and it, the temple is set into the mountain. Now, along the sides of that staircase, Today, they're carved into the shape of falcons, but many, many moons ago, they were actually snakes. They were cobras, and you can actually still see the tails going up alongside the staircase. So there's our symbolism of, of the energy. Off to the side of the temple, you have the remnants of the base of a pyramid. That's all that's left of it. But uh, if you subscribe to like Christopher Dunn's idea that uh, these pyramids were used as power plants. To me, whether it was a power plant, at least some sort of machine. I know we're going to talk about the Great Pyramid later, so we'll get to that. Um, so you have this pyramid here that was powering the temple. As you walk back up the staircase and you start going through the different chambers, on those uh, doorways, you have the label Stargate, 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 all the way back. Now, straight back is the Holy of Holies. What's interesting though, is there's a couple of guards standing there. They will not let you back in there unless you go up super early, pay them a bunch of money, and they'll let you inside. <laughs> and what's back there inside the Holy of Holies against the one wall is this cartouche filled with stars. So this is like the ultimate designation of a Stargate. And you have the depiction there of a high priest with a band of energy basically it almost looks like this lasso sort of thing and it's wrapped around this cartouche full of stars did you did you happen to see that on your latest trip there um no we actually did not stop off at hatshepsut's temple on this particular trip unfortunately i saw that the previous trip the first time around okay and one more thing that I would like to touch on before we continue on to our next topic is you had mentioned in one of your YouTube videos about Abydos. And there's actually yes. three Stargates that are depicted. We found more. <laughs> no way. More? <laughs> yes, so we found more. Um, there's, there's those three. And then in a side area of the temple, there's actually a, a couple more. What's fascinating, um, if you sift through all of my photos, um, we didn't catch the light quite right this time around. Um, but the first time, the light was coming in uh, at such an angle that there's these um, skylights that are in there, you know, open open holes uh, to the sky. And you can literally stand in there and catch the light with your hands. And that's inside these couple of other Stargates. So there are several that are back there. Um, and I mentioned earlier the depiction of the raising of the Jed Pillar that's right there where uh, the first three are. And the question would be, why would you need to depict it so many times in one temple? Do you have a speculation? For well, that? where we usually see the depiction of Stargate is next to a particular uh, Pharaoh's cartouche. So the in, in this sense, the, uh, the Pharaoh, the king is, you know, claiming that they have the power to be able to operate the Stargates, that they have this celestial knowledge of the stars. And when we look at Abydos, the Temple of Seti there, we see a lot of, uh, you know, those sacred numbers, those ancient sacred numbers, like 72, the procession of the equinox, it's built right into the building. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're seeing all of these connections between uh, the stars, the Stargates, and the uh, the kings that are claiming to have this knowledge and this ability to be able to traverse into the Stargates. I would love to have that kind of knowledge now. I mean, <laughs> you go from one place to another and it's like like that. Forget driving, forget trains, forget airplanes, just having Stargates. Very much like the TV show, 
totally loved it when it came out. Oh, I wasn't was even alive when this. it came out, but I got to watch the reruns and I thoroughly enjoyed those. But something else that I find really interesting when it comes to your research is you've looked into the potential connection between Atlantis and Egypt. Now, it seems that Greek historians associated ancient Egypt with the legendary Atlantis, and we are aware that's kind of where Plato got his information about Atlantis from, was from Egypt. Now, right. there has been other researchers that have looked into it. We're also aware that clairvoyant Edgar Casey had also done some work on that as well. But for yourself, having visited Egypt several times, doing extensive research, what have you found that has led you to believe that there's a connection between Egypt and Atlantis? Well, that's where the story came from. Um, you know, Plato didn't just sit down one day and write the Tamias and Critias and, and come up with these stories. And both of them are incomplete, by the way. We don't know if he just stopped writing them or if uh, the other sections have been lost to time. Uh, these stories were passed down from uh, from Solon, which was uh, basically his, his great great uncle. About 150 years uh, separated the two, but Solon had gone to Egypt. He also was a Greek philosopher. He had gone to Egypt to the Temple of Sais, and within that temple, he met uh, you know priests from Egypt, and one of them, uh, Sanchis, you know, showed him this depiction, uh, this story of Atlantis. Unfortunately, the Temple of Sais is completely gone. It's just a ruin now. Um, but at one point in time, this is where that story resided. And we see remnants of it uh, within the Temple of Edfu. We see uh, a story about the, the prime evil ones, really the, the netters that, uh, or the gods, that had come from their original homeworld, for, for lack of a better term, and they were cast out by a cataclysm, and they wandered the globe searching for a new place to live, and they settled in what we now call Egypt. So it's kind of some scant details of the original Atlantis story that is there at Edfu, but uh, where Solon got it was the Temple of Sais originally. And for those that aren't really too familiar with that temple, what does it say in there in particular that gives people the conclusion about the story of Atlantis and it being documented there? Well, it's uh, you have some very similar details. So uh, in its destruction by fire and by water. And so when we look at the destruction of Atlantis, very, very similar where uh, you had the destruction of, of fire and water. Now we can also look back into our ancient history. And, you know, when we talk about like perhaps the great flood, or when we look at some of these other ideas of a great cataclysm, uh, you can look at like the comet impact theory, which of course you would have the great fire of the comet and then the uh, the flooding afterward, or if you subscribe to the idea of some sort of massive solar flare uh, that would have done basically the same type of damage, you have the same sort of thing, fire from the solar flare, and then of course the flooding afterward from the from the melting of, of the ice. So um, it, it seems like all of this is really tied in together. And what have you found from your research? Well, that has been my research. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, I mean, I, well, because I mean, no, I, I totally get what you mean. You're, you're looking at what people have to yeah, say. Yeah, looking at all these different stories the and piecing everything together. Yeah, of it's course. kind of trying to make those connections, right? Of course. And and then my question would be, there's, there's a handful of people that see that connection. But for the most part, people brush off Atlantis as a mythical location that was created by Plato's imagination. Why do you think researchers are caring about this now and believing it to be Egypt, where we've heard researchers claim that every location at some point in time <laughs> is Atlantis, every piece of the ocean, Atlantis. But now there's some people thinking, what if it never sank? What if it is Egypt? And my question would be, why do you think that's the case maybe versus it being in the ocean or being in, in a location that has been discussed before or even Antarctica? 
Well, yeah, I don't necessarily you know believe that um, you know Atlantis was there in Egypt. There are some people that do believe like uh, Heliopolis was you know possibly a colony. Some people believe it was like the capital of Atlantis. I don't believe that. Uh, it may have had some connection there. Um, I, mean, I believe where we get the story of Atlantis is from Egypt. That's where the story originates. Uh, but we do see some uh, remnants of that throughout other cultures because we're all they're all talking about the same story. They're all talking about a cataclysm. Something happened. Now, as far as the location of Atlantis, Atlantis itself was not just like one city. Sure, it had the capital city where it had the concentric rings. You had the temple in the middle. A lot of people believe that temple actually did house a Stargate or some sort of portal or something like that. But Atlantis itself was a a massive civilization that spread out across the world. And when that cataclysm happened, you had survivors that had to scatter across. And I believe some of those survivors did end up in Egypt and they passed down their story. And we see a lot of symbolism in Egypt and in other cultures that are very, very similar. Like you have the, uh, the spiral pattern that seems to permeate not just throughout that area, but across uh, the entire world where, you know, they're talking about either a cataclysm or some sort of portal or something like that. It's all related imagery. Um, it just happens that the remnants of the story uh, for Atlantis comes from Egypt. And what I find interesting, though, is it seems like by keeping the name Atlantis, we've kept it like this mythological type of of imagery. Uh, Atlantis itself is a is a Greek term. It wasn't called Atlantis in you know in the original Egyptian, and the Greeks seem to have you know done this sort of thing like uh, the the name Egypt. Well, that was never the name of that land. Uh, it was it was Kemet, uh, which means the black land, basically for the rich black soil that flowed down from the Nile at the inundation season. But when the Greeks took over, when Alexander the Great invaded. Um, they called it Egyptus and ended up truncating over time uh, when we anglicized the term, we took off the end of it and just called it Egypt instead of Egyptus. We did the same thing with like Ptolemy. In, uh, in ancient Greek times, he was Ptolemaeus. Well, we anglicized it to Ptolemy. Why didn't we do the same with Atlantis? We kept that, you know, S at the end of it rather. Shouldn't it be like Atlant or something like that? You know, so it's it, we've kept it like this whole, you know, mythological air about it. Could you imagine calling it Atlant? That sounds, I know, that right? sounds it terrible. Sounds weird. I know. <laughs> no, I don't. It, it doesn't roll off no, nicely. No. It just it sounds. I actually don't have any words to describe that. It just does not sound good. But something that I found really interesting um, about preparing for today's show and looking at where you went for your tour, you, and of course, when you go to Egypt, you have to go and visit the Great Pyramid. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, there, there is no exception when you do that. And there seems to be, believed to be several functions for the Great Pyramid. And Mohammed, the tour guide, had mentioned in an interview on your YouTube channel that the pyramid could not just be a power plant it doesn't just have healing properties it's not just a portal but it's everything and more so how did he come up with those conclusions and what evidence is there to say that this is the case and not a standard burial ground that we've been taught in the globally accepted history books well for one no bodies were ever found within the great pyramid so there's there's that we don't we haven't found uh, you know those in, in any of those pyramids on like the the second pyramid that was not there, um, so that that kind of hurts the case for that. But you know it's it's much more than that because people say well tomb robbers okay well when uh, when they broke into the pyramid uh, through I mean we enter in through the, what they call the robbers entrance now um, they they did not find a body in there. Um, but there's a there's a lot more th than just that, um, you know. As far as you know, the different ideas that the pyramid had many many different functions, like for healing. Well, you're talking that 
this is on a location with a with a lot of earth energy. We mentioned Nikola Tesla earlier trying to harness uh, the power of the the earth for a lot of different functions, and the uh, Giza Plateau is on one of those you know nodes of energy. What we uh, People refer to them as ley lines, but really you're talking about the telluric currents of the earth, the, the earth energy that's that's wrapping around the planet, which is which is very measurable. And this these pyramids happen to be on top of that. The Great Pyramid specifically is very it's perfectly situated uh, right there on the plateau. Now, as it's harnessing that energy, it's it's to do a number of different things. And I know there's the idea that you know it was used as a power plant, and Perhaps, and I think in some different ways. I, th I think it was, um, you know, raising the consciousness, raising the energy, you know, of the location for a, a number of different things. Um, for one, you, know, you have to think about what uh, was on the primary interest of the ancient Egyptian minds, and that was their inundation season, when the Nile River would flood, bring down that uh, rich black land to uh, to plant and uh, grow their crops. Well, if you have this massive pyramid that is harnessing that energy and able to spread it across the land to, you know, help with those growth of crops, to, you know, raise the consciousness and raise the, uh, you know, everybody's internal energy so that you have a very, you know, you have a happier society. So I think it was used in a lot of uh, cases like that. Now, as far as it being a machine, the smoking gun is in the queen's chamber. A lot of people talk about the king's chamber. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's rose granite that's been blackened. It's, it's really kind of bizarre to look at. Um, but the smoking gun is in the queen's chamber. There's this niche in the one wall that's it's offset from the center. It looks kind of strange, and it has a um, you know, a corbelled type of a siding, which you see in the grand gallery. Um, those those corbelled walls that go it's massive. It's huge. And we actually see this in some other pyramids too, uh, which kind of, it, you know, likens it to being some sort of actually like a harmonic resonance type of machine. We can talk about that later, but in the queen's chamber there in this niche on the wall in the back, you have these black scorch marks and vitrification in the stone. The stone has actually been melted. Now, our traditional uh, archaeology and Egyptologists will tell us, well, you know, this is a niche where it would be a great place for like some sort of statue or idol, none of which was ever found there. It would be a great place for that. Okay, well, I don't think a statue or an idol would have melted the wall behind it. And so something extremely, extremely hot was right there uh, in that niche. We don't know what or how it functioned. Uh, a lot of different theories, but to me, that's a smoking gun of it, of saying that this was some sort of machine. I've personally have heard stories of there being a Baghdad battery there. There have been tests on the Baghdad battery that it really does create some type of energy uh, release. But I hadn't actually heard of any stories of people being healed in and around the area of the Great pyramids have you have you heard of that personally well, i think when we talk about healing I, I don't think anybody's you know gone there you know blind and come out seeing sort of thing you know <laughs> I, I haven't really heard stories like that but i, I think um uh, when we talk about you know healing I, I think we're talking about uh more of like a spiritual healing and i've i've heard a lot of stories from a variety of different people uh going into the great pyramid and coming out totally just, you know, transfixed. Like they are on just a completely different level. And maybe some of that's shock and awe. Uh, I know I was quite in awe when I first went inside. Um, but everybody that I talk to uh, that has been inside uh, always talks about this extremely palpable energy that's inside. And they, it, they come out, you know, talking about having a life-changing experience inside the pyramid. Thank you for clarifying that because I was a bit confused, but that makes a lot more yeah. sense now. What's really exciting, though, is that you got to spend two hours mm -hmm. inside of the Great Pyramid with only you and your group. How was that? Uh, it's, it's amazing. So that's something that uh, you know we do with Mohammed's group. We'll be doing it again next year, too. We're going back in April of 2024. 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be able to have that time. And, um, you know, Mohammed knows the right people to get into, you know, all the different areas. So we go down to the subterranean chamber, uh, which is really quite interesting to think that, you know, here you are underneath uh, you know, the greatest ancient monument in the world uh, you know, under the Great Pyramid. And it's, uh, it, it's just a totally bizarre different world inside there. Uh, and then being able to spend time alone uh, in the different chambers, in the Grand Gallery, in the Queen's Chamber, in the King's Chamber, and just really, you are in awe. And, uh, you know, a lot of people take time to meditate inside there. Um, we've done some different tests with, um, you know, so there are, there are tests done years ago on determining, like, what, using sound and vibration to determine what key that the uh, the pyramid is tuned to. And those tests came back saying it was tuned to the key of F sharp, F sharp and the coffer inside the uh, king's chamber uh, to the key of A. So last time I brought with my, I brought with myself a uh, chromatic tuner and tuning forks to see, okay, is this true? Is this the case? And uh, sure enough, we actually were able to duplicate those results. And for those that don't know, uh, the key of the earth is F sharp. So somehow the ancients created this massive pyramid, tuned it to the key of F sharp, which is the key of the entire planet. How is that possible in your opinion? That's a, a wonderful question. Um, they had some sort of knowledge that we just don't have today, you know, some sort of knowledge that has been lost to time, and you know, even just the, you know, construction methods of it, you know, are highly, highly, highly debated as to how they actually pulled it off and how they actually did it, uh, which we, we truly don't know. Um, you know, something is is gone, and um, you know, you just uh, thinking about the way civilizations kind of ebb and flow. Um, you know, we talk about a, a great cataclysm, you know, when that happened, that that knowledge was lost. And the, the people that survived didn't have that that type of engineering know how and they had to go into survival mode. Uh, so they weren't, you know, thinking about uh, uh, building great pyramids or things like that. Again, it was, you know, we're going to survive and then their descendants, well, they had to relearn everything, but didn't have that previous knowledge of how to build these sorts of things or, you know, harmonize the way that the, you know, far ancients did. And what's very unique about the Great Pyramid is actually the floor right outside of the pyramid, because all of the pieces are all very unique shapes. None match the other. They're complete. We, we would classify it as random, but that might not actually be the case. What was explained um, from your tours was that it's, it's possibly related to harnessing and protecting the vibrations that could potentially be created from that pyramid. And that's a plausible explanation to why some people think that it is a powerhouse giving off that vibration based off of the floor. So like when you came across that information, were you like, yeah, that's absolutely it? Or did you seem kind of skeptical when you first heard that? Well, that interlocking design, you know, makes a lot of sense. If you if you were to keep everything perfectly straight and you have, you know, a lot of vibration, a lot of movement, um, things are going to shift out of place very easily. But with that interlocking design where, you know, no two pieces are uh, the same shape, but they are perfectly cut to be able to interlock with each other like that, um, then that's going to create a very, very solid design. And so, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense that, uh, you know, if this is, if this is a machine and you have a lot of that vibration going on, obviously the thing is getting very hot. Um, you know, then your, your base outside, if you keep it interlocked like that, uh, will remain in place. And we see that in the Valley temple too, where you have an interlocking design in the blocks like that. And it's, you know, from a modern engineering standpoint, it would take a lot of extra work, a lot of extra man hours and money to be able to create that sort of design. But here you have the ancients, which we're told we're using primitive tools to make this, uh, creating these, you know, wonderful designs that are, that were extremely, extremely solid. 
So overall, what do you think the pyramids were created for? <laughs> uh, Putting I'm, you on the spot. Mike. Yeah, you are, because I'm still trying to deduce that myself. Machine, yes. What the machine was used for, um, that's still up to debate for me. I mean, I, I do believe it was you know, used in some way to help uh, raise the uh, vibration and consciousness uh, of the area. And there's a lot of ideas that, um, you know, as this was expelling that energy, things like the obelisks were used to uh, you know, almost like wireless access points to be able to, uh, or like wireless repeaters to be able to harness that and continue to, to push it on. And that's a wonderful idea. Um, but I, I think we have a long way to go yet to, to prove something like that and actually determine what the specific function of that was. When you bring up the concept of consciousness and raising the vibration, why would that be significant in ancient times? What would be the purpose behind that from your understanding? Uh, they were much they were much more in tune to uh, the universe as a whole. So when we start talking about um, you know, personal resonance, vibration, consciousness, that sort of thing, um, they looked at things universally, not just the planet, not just their little community. You know, they were uh, engaged with the stars. They were engaged with uh, you know, the constellation of Orion, the Sirius star, these sorts of things. So they were also thinking off planet. Um, I believe in uh, many of these cases that you know they knew how to project their consciousness you know, across the cosmos. I believe that's how um, they were able to interact with. When we start talking about you know communications, possibly with you know, extraterrestrials, all, other life forms, possibly interdimensional beings. That you know they were using some of these techniques to be able to do that. It, it wasn't just a local thing that they were trying to do here to. You know, I mentioned growing crops and things like that. Yes, that was part of it, um, but they had a much wider scope of the universe on that level than we have today. So kind of like astral projection? Yeah, in, in that sort of sense, yes. Very interesting, because there have been some other concepts with other ancient civilizations that think that their um, unique buildings or their unique pyramids had a similar function. And what we've seen through basic research is that almost every single ancient culture has a pyramid. Right. Okay. We have seen that time and time again, if not a pointy pyramid like this one, then it would be a step pyramid as right. well. And these have always been classified as sacred, very, very important for the ancient culture. And it's been believed by many that only the people of really high status or the priests could kind of go up there and and do whatever they needed to do to communicate with the gods. And then the question could be, who were the gods, right? Were they right. actual entities of a heavenly realm? Or could they just have been extraterrestrials masking themselves as godlike deities? Or were we just too primitive during that time to think that anything that could or anyone that was superior to us would be classified as a god. Yeah, there's definitely a story that's been lost to time that we had we see scant pieces of within our ancient mythology. Like we look at the um, you know the story of Osiris, and we see you know a very uh, similar story to that of Inki, to that of Viracocha. So it's almost like the, you know we're talking about uh, the same person, giving it a different name within these different cultures, but they all serve the same function. You know, how is it that you know, all these different cultures that were separated by thousands and thousands of miles that were not supposed to have connections to each other are, are all talking about the, the same story. Uh, so there is a there is a connection there that has been lost. And, you know, a lot of researchers today that are in you know this particular field are, are trying to put those pieces together. All of us are looking for that answer. And at this point yeah. in time, we can just merely speculate. But that's where a lot of people have their attention at is understanding how are all of these different cultures sharing the same kinds of stories, very similar architecture as well, when by our modern archaeologists, they should have been incredibly primitive, using very mundane tools, creating these immaculate structures it it boggles the mind and so many of us are asking how is this possible we need a time machine or at least a tardis to get those answers 
Right, exactly. And when you look at uh, something like ancient Egypt, you know, the it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because um, if you look at the you know traditional timeline, it's almost like the ancient Egyptian civilizations you know sprang up out of nowhere, fully formed. It actually does not have that gradual ramp up period that we're told is supposed to happen. Just all of a sudden, boom! Here's the civilization. Here's the hieroglyphs, and, and it just it does not make much sense at all. But yet there it is. So what happened? Let's let's stick on to that thought because let's talk about the true age of Egypt. Many of us have speculations, um, but what have you found? Yeah, that's um, well. When you start looking at uh, you know things like well, I'll just, I'll just you know reference the work that uh, like John Anthony West and Robert Schock did uh, you know back in the early '90s, which is one of the things that set me on this path. Uh, you mentioned you know, the movie Stargate, and it was really those two things: Mysteries of the of the Sphinx uh, special that came out with uh, with Charlton Heston as the the host, and then it was like within a few months or maybe the next year that boom, the movie Stargate came out, and you know, so that <laughs> that really inspired me on on this research and this path to begin with. But you know, that was wonderful work in. Uh, in redating the Sphinx and the weathering that's on the enclosure. And to me, it was just bizarre uh, looking at it that uh, that an Egyptologist, archaeologist could look at the weathering pa pattern on there. That's you know, the, the channeling from uh, water erosion. And you know, we see that type of runoff all the time on like, the side of a hill or something like that. And, you know, look at that and say, that's not water. It obviously was. Um, but, you know, they kept saying, well, where's a you know pot shard from that time and things like that. It's like, well, you know, we're talking about geology here. Uh, and then for years and years and years, they're saying, well, there's no other, uh, you know, civilizations that are that old. And then, oh, here's Gobekli Tepe. So, you know, we are finding, you know, more and more and more that the age of things in the past are far older than we previously believed. And so, you know, the Sphinx is just uh, one example of that. But you know, we look at something like the uh, like the Bent Pyramid, and um, you know, Sneferu. When you actually look at his name, um, it make it means the restorer. And so, when you look at uh, buildings that were built by Sneferu, you know, his name is the restorer. He was restoring these buildings. So, when you look at uh, you know, when you go inside the Bent Pyramid, and you're taking a look at you know some of the way it's constructed inside, and you see these. Uh, uh, with their, their cedar timbers from uh, basically they would have been brought in from Lebanon and some of them are situated in such a, a way that you're like yeah that's just repair work that's not that's not original at all you can actually see it in there and you know if you throw out the conventional timeline that we've been given you're just looking at it, it's like yeah that was done after the fact and you know we see that in a lot of these different cases that makes you wonder and you, and you talk to some people in the area and some of the stories that have been passed down and there are people that will say well you know the the pyramids were already there they were found they were repurposed because you look in so many of these like great pyramid um you won't find hieroglyphs you know uh they're not dynastic you know every, every like temple from dynastic times had those hieroglyphs so why didn't the pyramids um you know, so it's it's different you know, kind of little smoking guns like that. Or um, Nubian Museum, there's an ostrich egg from what we would call uh, primitive, primitive times in Egypt, kind of like hunter-gatherers from long, long ago. And this ostrich egg has painted on it. It's a river, um, a nice big river, looks like the Nile. And there are these three triangles that uh, and it has the the marks there for the stones. You know, traditionalists will say, well, those are mountains. Like, well, they don't really have mountains like that, and they're in the right sizing. The Great Pyramid being the largest, and that's on the right, and then the uh, you know the second pyramid, and then the smaller one, you know, all the way down. It's like those are the three pyramids <laughs> that we know today. Um, they're by the Nile, you know. But you know, it, it, so it's things like that that. Kind of show us that oh these things are much older than we previously thought is this the one that you're referring there to? it is yes okay uh do we have a date on this 
Um, <laughs> what they say is uh, Paleolithic times. They don't really give us a specific date. Um, and that's one side of it. So the other side of it, um, and they flipped this around. So both times that I was there, they showed two different sides. It's the same uh, design on both, on both sides. Um, the other side has a little bit of a, the, the river is a bigger swath, really. But um, yeah, so there you go. You have your three pyramids by the Nile. I am trying to look for the other side. I'm only seeing... That's probably that side. looks like that's the recent photo. Yeah, it, the other okay. one would have been from like a year and a half ago. Okay, I I wasn't familiar with this. I actually had no idea this existed. This is really mm -hmm. really fascinating because we are aware that the Egyptians are, are were very proud with documenting everything that happened. But you're right with the with the information that you provided where there are certain pieces that just don't really have hieroglyphs. But then if we jump back even further, we're getting this on an ostrich egg out of all things, an right. egg that is so fragile. And yeah, how did that survive? <laughs> that's a big question right there. How did that survive? Mike, you're reading my mind. That's my yeah. exact question. <laughs> Stone is going to be your best friend. We've seen that time and time again with mm -hmm. human history. But you're going to you're going to draw what you're seeing on an egg. How did it last so long? How did it well, they're biodegradable? How did it survive to this day? And we have an estimate of what year it was created. We don't really know from from your knowledge. And that just makes it that much more interesting. Why are there pyramids when this is a time period of practically hunter and gatherers, or at least so we're told? Mm -hmm. Mike, I, I have so many questions. Yeah, no, this is one of those that just kind of gets ignored. You know, we're just we're not going to talk about what's on there. We're going to call them mountains. And you, they don't have, you know, sharp, pointy mountains like this in uh, in Egypt. In fact, they really don't have mountains in Egypt. They will call them mountains, except for, you know, Sinai Peninsula. Uh, you do have that because uh, like Mount Sinai and, and all that that's over there. But in, uh, you know, the Nile River Valley, you have some hills and some you know cliffs on those hills, but you don't have mountains like this. No, you don't. And that's what makes this country so fascinating is that there's all this speculation. This is one of the countries that is so well documented during that time that they were creating these pyramids, doing these hieroglyphs. And yet we're still guessing to this day while we have all this information, we don't actually have the answers. And that's where it's really frustrating. But what's even more frustrating is that modern archaeologists and Egyptologists to my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, they're not really adapting to the new information that is coming, uh, coming out, or the other plausible explanations, such as the Great Pyramid, the purpose of it. They're really sticking to what they originally thought, and that being a burial ground. And I can go for all these other locations as well, where they're not really changing their story. And I say this so many times, but I'm going to say it again right here. Knowledge is power. And if you don't have knowledge, then you're going to be easily manipulated in, in the information, in the history and things like this. So my question for you, Mike, is with all of this and this information that's coming out, even looking at this egg, doing your tour, speaking to experts in the field, do you think we need to change our history books or just keep them the way that they are and keep people <laughs> believing what they're believing at this point in time? You know, it's, it's funny to me uh, with, with that. Yes, we do need to change our history books, but it, it's funny to me because a lot of these, um, you know, traditional researchers, it, w one of their issues is they don't want to, you know, they've already written books and they don't want to, um, you know, fly in the face of their previous research and the books that they've already written. And to me, I'm kind of scratching my head like you could write another book and sell more copies. I don't understand what the problem is here. Um, but they do try to keep that traditional narrative going. One of the problems is, is funding, of course, right? Um, for, for a lot of the uh, research that they are doing, you know, they, you know, they're, they're government grants. They are it's, it's money funded by uh, some sort of university, that sort of thing. So if they suddenly fly in the face of the traditional narrative that is not approved by these other organizations, their funding is going to get pulled. Um, so that's where I said, well, just sell enough copies of your books. And you, know, you, might have, you might not have to worry about that funding. But, that, you know, it's a legitimate 
concern uh, by them. And then there's also others that, you know, they've been doing this for, you know, 40, 50 years. And, you know, there, there's a bit of a pride, there's a bit of an ego there. And, and they don't want to admit that what they've been teaching, what they've been talking about for the last 40 or 50 years has been wrong. So there's some of that at play as well. But, uh, and, and I kind of feel bad for them uh, because at some point, you know, the reason why they got into the field was, you know, they had a passion for it. They wanted to be you know, like the Indiana Jones of their time. And for some of these guys, you know, they, uh, they've been around longer than Indiana Jones ever was. Um, you know, they've, they've been there a long, long time, but they had a passion for this field. And at some point in time, that passion turned to preservation and they will do anything that they can to maintain the narrative that they've set in place. And that's, that's a shame. You bring up two great points, ego and funding. These are things that need to be considered when you're doing research, when you're looking into these things, have it be archaeology, have it be any kind of scientific research, have it even be the UFO and paranormal field as well. You need to understand people's no motives, but also have a basic understanding of their personality as well. And that, and they're, they're going to show their true colors on their purpose for giving off that information, right? And so it's it's unfortunate, but for the majority of people, their research is running off of their ego, like, oh, if I show this is going to be like the coolest thing on the planet, and I'm going to stick to this because if I change my mind, people are going to corner me because I'm not allowed to change, right? And then you right. have the second, the second little tidbit, and that is funding and or any kind of money. And then that's the aspect of greed as well. And I think that's why our civilization is as it is right now. It's deteriorating because of those two factors. Now, it's, it's, it's a part of basic survival. And that's, that's the unfortunate part when it comes to us is we, in order to survive, we need to hoard more than what we need. And we need to think about ourselves. AI, um, EI, um, I know, right. My bad. Yeah, AI is a different topic. <laughs> AI is a different topic, <laughs> but I, he, ego, excuse yeah. me there. So it, it, when we look at this information, it's important to keep in mind those two factors. But then you have this other aspect of people, such as yourself, that has this childlike curiosity that wants to find the answers. You want to understand and you're very transparent with your research. We need more people like that because it's those people that are making the change. It's those people that are really putting in the work that is that that the rest of humanity, that the public deserve. It's exactly what you're doing. Well, and I appreciate that. And yeah, we're, you know, guys like me and my colleagues, I mean, we're not tied to a specific organization. So that allows us a lot of freedom. You know, we're not, uh, we're not pigeonholed into one specific area. And that, that gives us a lot of leeway to be able to you know, look at things from a lot of different angles and try to put those uh, different pieces together. And uh, what, what's fascinating to me is that, um, you know, a lot of these Egyptologists, archaeologists, they won't talk to uh, other experts from different fields. Like they won't talk to a, a geologist. They won't talk to um, like a, a botanist or uh, somebody like that when they really need to, to learn a little bit more about the context of some of these different things that uh, they're actually stumbling across. They instead put it into the you know, just a, you know, a historic context or, or something like that. And it's like, well, but there are certain elements and certain factors that go into that from other scientific fields that you need to consider as well. So, um, so, you know, investigative journalists and other researchers from outside of those fields can look at a multiple, a multitude of different fields and kind of piece those things together. And I think that's what guys like, uh, you know, Graham Hancock and, and some others are doing. Um, you know, Robert Schock is a geologist, but he also considers outside factors as well. And, and a lot of those guys. And this is a great transition to look at our final topic, and that's false narratives when it comes to Egypt. So for this particular topic, I came across a story that I actually didn't know existed was a myth. And that was, as the legend goes, Napoleon did the deed during the French campaign in Egypt in 1798, where he got a cannon and he shot off the <laughs> nose of the Sphinx. Now, this is a complete myth. This is not true. But for a good period of time, people believed this. Now, 
luckily I was never taught this information. And I'm like, that's a false narrative right there. That, that's a pretty wild one. And just imagine how many angry people are going to be, would be chasing Napoleon after that. Like one of the most significant pieces of the archaeology of Egypt, right? What the, One of those famous statues, the Sphinx, the Great Sphinx. And someone shoots off its nose to make a statement. Yeah, um, that, that's unfortunate that they got um, put at Napoleon's feet. But what's interesting is, you know, for all the things you can say about Napoleon, he, he had an absolute genuine interest in ancient Egypt. And we actually have him to thank for a lot of the information that that we have. You know, he brought all kinds of scientists and artists with him. Um, a lot of our uh, drawings that we have of locations that have been lost to time are now in ruins are you know from Napoleon's expedition there? Uh, the Rosetta Stone uh, was found you know by the French uh, by Napoleon's people, uh, so we would not have be able to translate the hier hieroglyphs if not for uh, Napoleon, or maybe it would take a li little bit longer. Uh, maybe somebody else would have uh, stumbled across that stone at some point. But uh, yeah, we actually have Napoleon to thank for a lot with uh, with Egyptology today. Looking at this image, a lot of the times when we look at the Great Pyramids of Giza, we imagine it to be in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. It takes several camels to get from point A to point B because they're going to die of exhaustion, right? But it's actually just on the outskirts of Cairo. And you see very, very few images like this one where you're seeing the the ancient world with the modern world. because it. For some, it takes away the magic of the pyramids. But I think for myself, it shows how that culture has integrated with the ancient culture and have still and have still kept it to what it is today. Yeah, uh, the city is really encroached on it. Um, so basically, you have uh, Cairo and then Giza. That's actually uh, the Giza, what you're seeing there. But it ba they basically mesh into each other. And even now, uh, there's more of the city being developed on the other side uh, of the of the pyramids. So they're they're calling that um, I think they're calling it West Cairo or West Giza. It's the West. They're expanding into the West now. Um, so I don't know how they're getting all the water out there where we stayed at. Uh, there was a, even a golf course out there. You're seeing all these sprinklers with the water. It's like Jeez. where is that coming from? Um, but yeah, they are. They've really expanded beyond that. And you, they position the uh, the photographers and the camels in such a way to get that classic shot of, you know, looking like uh, the pyramids are out there in the desert. But no, it, it's right there next to the next to the city. What other false narratives have you come across when doing the research about Egypt that you're like, wait, hold on? Yeah, you know, we and we kind of talked about some here with uh, you know the dating of the pyramids, the Sphinx, uh, you know things like that. Uh, one that's kind of interesting, and, and again, it's back at Hatshepsut's temple. Um, you know, this idea that the Egyptians were kind of confined to their area. You know, they had the Nile, there was the Red Sea, but they kind of kept to themselves. They were not known as great seafarers outside of the river, but yet. You know, we do see that they got up to places like Ireland and Scotland. In fact, um, you know, those, those two countries kind of fight over, you know, whether or not, you know, which one has the Stone of Destiny, which actually comes out of uh, Egyptian stories about uh, regarding the, the Princess Skoda. In fact, Scotland is named for uh, the Egyptian Princess Skoda. Uh, so they somehow got up there. You know, Egyptian beads have been found in the amount of hostages up there. But at Hatshepsut's temple, there is this depiction of a journey to a place called Puntland. And if you do a Google search on Puntland, P-U-N-T, you will find that most, uh, most people traditionally put it like right at the southern tip of the Red Sea, like around the Ethiopia area. Problem with this depiction that's on Hatshepsut's temple, this is a 1,500-year-old temple. Um, it, it shows a lot of different uh, wildlife and uh, floral life, different trees and uh, plants and, and things like this. Some of the sea creatures were not native to the Red Sea. They have an interesting depiction of a coconut tree that's on there. And the last time that I was uh, in Egypt and we we're uh, talking about this, you know, Muhammad's like, this doesn't, 
you know, make sense. You know, there's a coconut tree here. Um, it's not indigenous to Africa. We have to find out where the coconut tree is from. And there are coconut trees there in Africa now. Uh, where they first came into play, however, was in Madagascar, which is quite a way south from the Red Sea and also wasn't introduced until 500 AD. So that's a 2,000 year difference. So the Egyptians had made some sort of longer uh, journey there and where we find where coconut trees uh, or originated from would have been Southeast Asia, Indonesia, that area of the world. And there are some rumors of uh, Egyptians getting to Australia, which traditional archaeologists would say, no, that never happened. But okay, then then where did they see the coconut tree? Uh, you know, 2000 years before it was introduced to Egypt. Right. And you also have those Egyptian looking hieroglyphs in Australia as well. And then people mm -hmm. are thinking that maybe the Egyptians went over to Australia at some point in time and influenced right that area. Others believe that it was during one of the world wars that the um, soldiers had come had gone back to Australia and they just created that out of the fascination of Egyptian history. So there there is that speculation there when it comes to Egypt and Australia. But what you brought up about the coconut trees, I'm like, that's new information to me. That's very cool. Yeah, who who would have thought to look up coconut trees? And and you look up those dates, and that's you know, that's from the traditional science. That's not doing anything funny with uh, you know Egyptian history or like alternative history or anything like that. It's just simply looking up when did coconut trees come over to Africa? <laughs> that's it. Um, so you know, you kind of use their own. You know, okay, you you have a traditional date of Hatshepsut's temple at about 1500 because her reign was, um, was it 1476 BC to 1456 BC, thereabouts. So that's their tradition. And some, and some alternative uh, theorists will say that the temple's even older, but we'll go with the traditional dates. And then we'll go with the traditional science on, you know, the coconut as well. And, you know, it, it doesn't add up. No, no, it doesn't. A little bit earlier, you mentioned the Stone of Destiny. I'm not familiar with that. Can you just, can you tell us about it? Um, ooh, okay, I wasn't prepared for that one today. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, um, you know, some just like a, a rough Yeah, summer. you know, some interesting uh, Irish and, and Scottish uh, history here where, um, geez, I'm trying to remember here off the top of my head. So these were some... Um, different battles between the indigenous people of the land at the time and then the people that came over with uh the, the princess skoda and you know the stone of destiny was brought over there's some supernatural beings that are uh involved in this but the stone of destiny was involved there uh as well to you know help empower uh one of those uh tribes now what's interesting again this gets debated on between the Scottish and the Irish. Uh, the Irish Stone of Destiny right now is at the, the Hill of Terra. And uh, it marks, it was originally in front of the Mound of Hostages. Now it's on top of the Hill of Terra. It basically marks different burial, uh, mass burial there. But the uh, in Scotland, it was... Um, basically was out in a courtyard for a while and then uh some kids came along broke the thing and i believe now it's oh it, it's in a castle over there right now i forget which one no so, absolutely no no i i didn't mean to put you on the spot like that okay. but you, you brought it up and i'm like i don't know yeah, i know is. i brought it up i brought it up <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for doing this show with me today. Where can people find you online? Uh, sure. Yeah, you can find me MikeRickSecker.com. That's my primary website. I also have an online learning portal, ConnectedUniversePortal.com. Uh, and then, of course, I have all my uh, social media. And this Friday, if people want to tune in, I uh, have an appearance on Ancient Aliens talking about the Alaska Triangle. Totally different topic, but there you have it. And all of his research about the Alaskan Triangle is fascinating. Mike, I want to put you backstage, okay? Thank you. So just hang tight. If you enjoyed Mike Ricksecker, all of his links are in the description box below. He does fantastic research on everything 
that he touches. It was an absolute pleasure to have him on today's show. Top five, the weird and mysterious, talking about mysterious Egypt. On Thursday is Mysteries with a History with Jimmy Church from Beta Black Radio at 2.30 p.m. PST. And then Friday is Weekly Strange News at 3 p.m. PST. Those shows are live, so you do not want to miss them. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notification bell set for all notifications so that you do not miss any of the shows that we do right here. If you want to continue today's conversation, bring it over to the Discord server. That Discord server link is also in the description box below where you can talk with 1,400 other like-minded members talking about everything like this and so much more. It's open 24-7 and it's a safe and friendly place where you can share your thoughts, ideas, insights, and stories as well. That is it for today. I will see you on Thursday. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.